humanity. Sorry. No, carry on. This is from from Zoom. Uh, traditional life speak of his exceptional physical vigor, his phenomenal creative output, his good sense and moderation, and deep humanity, and broad sympathy and compassion for all. Though after decades of uncertainty and insecurity and wanderings for suitable conditions for his work, he found peace and security under the protection of King Naranarayana of Kuch Bihar. But his mission later found fertile ground in Assam proper, the Brahmaputra Valley, thanks to the effort and sacrifice of his devotees after him. At present, there are only three or four sutras in Kush Bihar. Sutras are centers of religious, Vaishnava religion and culture, and more than 800 sutras in the Brahmaputra, the rest of the Brahmaputra Valley. While undoubtedly an upshoot, the tremendous bhakti movement that swept the entire country right to the Middle Ages, his religion had some unique characteristics, his sect or creed. It aroused from stagnation the common people who had been paralyzed by the benumbing oppression of Brahminical Hinduism, particularly downtrodden lower castes and women, victims of casteism and patriarchy. You know, we are certainly exposed to an interest by the surging waves of the doctrinal, intellectual and cultural influence of the bhakti movement, he brought his unique powers to powers to synthesize these elements with elements from Assamese folk culture as well as products of his vast erudition in many branches of knowledge and arts. Besides, he gave a rich, colorful, cultural turn to the practice of devotion, congregational chanting of stories of God's miracles and grace, devotional songs called Borgi, dance dramas with dialogue called Bhavna, and conduct of daily life. His wide erudition in more many different fields of learning and arts also must have helped. Together, these stories and verse, daily sung in common prayer halls called Namghor, had been gathered during his lifetime into a book called Kirtan. It is the stories of Kirtan that are chanted daily in chorus to set tunes accompanied by music, musical instruments. Shankaradev's rendering of stories of the Bhagavata Purana, the main vehicle for the inculcation of bhakti in his creed, embellish the original stories with vivid poetic and dramatic touches to make them more accessible to the devotees. The dance dramas called Bhavna is a loftier idiom with sprinkling of mightily to give an impression of sublimity. Though there are also episodes of comic relief. Remarkably, throughout the Middle Ages in India, his dramas alone seem to have the seem to have this is distinction of using a racy prose dialogue. 
as other forms elsewhere depended on narrative, narration, and elaborate miming, and so on. Such bhavanas are still performed annually during the period of rest from labor in the fields throughout the countryside. But historically, it had been the Saktras or Vaisnava monasteries that were nerve centers of Vaisnava piety and culture, who traditionally trained musicians known, known as Gayon and Bayon, who trained the novices and were actually the final arbiters of the standards to be followed in performances at Namgors under numerous sutras and uh, borgits on the devotional songs set to specific ragas are also taught and rehearsed under their supervision. Now, of course, it is much more common. Incidentally, sutras used their used to patronize various other arts and crafts, such as making boards of paper from barks of sachi or aloe wood, copying and illustrating them with polychrome painting, and making fine mats of cane and ivory, and so on. The head of the sutra, known as Sartradhikar, was the final authority in assigning these tasks and offices to his disciples and setting standards. Though not, though not actually founded by Sankarbid himself, these sutras later became the institutional form in which his heritage was preserved and continued for centuries. The sutras later branched out into four main groups or Sanghotis, some more Brahminical inclined and uh, some more radical from the point of view of practice and belief. Unlike Kabir and Guru Nanak, Shankardev put at the center of his faith principally the Bhagavata Purana, which he refers to as the quintessence of the Vedas. Vedoro Haro, Vedoro Saro, this is what he calls the Bhagavata Purana. This Vaishnavite Purana combines an exposition of doctrine, the tales of wondrous feats of God as Krishna in overcoming the threats of evil in the form of various demons and dispensing mercy to the devotee. The external form of this creed is chanting the praise of God, extolling his powers and mercy by devotees, as I've said to the accompaniment of music, musical instruments. It is devoid of complex and costly Brahminical rituals and assumes and assures the devotee a direct personal access to God marked by utter simplicity. One can pursue this path of devotion while leading a domestic life and celibacy is not obligatory. It enjoins upon the devotee a complete submission to God and indifference to other Brahminical deities as the antidote to worldly suffering and salvation upon death. It teaches humility and tolerance for other creeds. Parodo dharmako nihinkiva kodasi. It elevates the moral outlook of devotees by exhorting the devotee to become a true bhakar 
and look upon all created beings as part of God, hence with respect, to be treated with respect and empathy. Shankardev was aware of the philosophical implications of the idea of God, of whom Krishna was a human incarnation. But he did not care to go into logical niceties and conceptual explorations. God was one and indivisible. All creatures are parts of him, but they wrongly consider themselves to be I think we have uh, audio problem. I think we lost the, we have lost the connection. Lost uh, the connection. Okay. <coughs> running heavily in Assam, Guwahati. <coughs> you will reconnect. Is uh -huh. there anybody else there uh, helping? Yeah, uh, there is a student helping him. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. Do you have the number of the student? I have, yeah. If you can call the student to say that, look, this is their dream. We know that. Uh, Hello, Vishnu. Sutada, how are you? I'm all right. Nice to see you after a long time. Yes. I met uh, Partho last night. Yes, yes. Partho is also here, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah, Partho. Where, 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 where did you meet him? Here, yeah, Partha is in New York. Oh, New York, okay. Partha, are you... Uh... I arrived just two days ago. Uh, uh, yeah. Two weeks. So. Oh, good, good. Yeah, yeah. May I continue, please? Yeah, Yeah, sure. sure. Though building upon the legacy of the Vaishnavite form of Brahminical Hinduism, he departs from it radically to loosen the trammels of caste and mentally liberate the devotees from the demeaning sense of inferiority and bondage through the path of devotion. Traditionally, Shudras were regarded as distinct to the ignobility of their lives produced by earlier sinful births. That was the Brahminical theory. But Shankardev says, even murmuring the name of Hari, God, can uh, cleanse in an instant sins accumulated by crores, millions of previous births. It just had a liberating effort, effect on the devotee from despised for the despised lower status of the caste system. It had been a revolutionary step in an age and society under the pall of casteist inequality and despair. Thus the common man harried and tortured by the burden of feudal oppression, compulsory labor, and caste oppression, was initiated into an enlarging vision of his own place, in an inexhaustibly enlarging vision of his own place, in an inexhaustibly varied and inexpressibly large universe, Anantakuti Brahmanda. He can conceive and articulate a sense of his own destiny against this background and look forward to a life of serenity and ultimate 
transcendence of fate and face calamities of life in peace and some fortitude. Thus endowed with a spiritual dignity and nobility, he could now face the world with some courage and spunk. However, by some quirk of history, as such teachings were not accompanied by actual social revolution, it helped Brahminical caste rules to return and were in fact reinforced by many sutras. One sutra stuck to a much more radical liberal view of caste, the famous Mohamoriya, Mohamoriya sutra. And it was its devotees from lower orders of society who were provoked by the ruthless a home of prison to a storm of revolt and bring that mighty monarchy to its knees. By that time, the Ahom monarchy had joined hands with Brahminical orthodoxy to enforce the caste and Brahminical practices with unprecedented ferocity. The Muhammadiyas even established their own rule, though they apparently had not extended their support base to other castes and communities. Following the restoration of the monarchy with British help, uh, to some extent of Brahminical orthodoxy too, Sattra stagnated and got loose from Shankardev's original liberating vision. The census reports of 1891, 19 etc. show rigid caste practices in the countryside with heads of monasteries enforcing them. With the spread of education and some secular influence under the British, the backward castes could no longer bear their front. And certain leaders, along with some prominent liberal Vaishnavite gurus, formed the Srimanta Shankar Dev Sangha, or Shankar Sangha, which expounded its influence and the, expanded its influence at the cost of the uh, socialist stagnant sectors. Its biennial sessions draw crowds as huge as five lakhs taking part in its activities in a most disciplined manner. We, however, conclude with a glimpse of Shankaradev's continued relevance in modern Assamese society and culture. Lakshminath Bezbolwa, the outstanding and seminal cultural figure of the Assamese Renaissance authored the first biography of Shankardev in modern prose, though he did not there, did not depart from traditional biographies known as charits. But he harped on continually the central significance of Shankardev and the uh, uh, as the true source of light for the Assamese nationality. It was eventually to be accepted by the Assamese people, though intrinsically there had been some resistance from Brahminically inclined groups. Uh, this vision was reinforced by the next major cultural icon of a son, Jyoti Prasad Agarwal, who gave a cultural turn to Shankaradeva's basically religious vision and modern cultural turn. Then Vishnu Rabha, the idol of succeeding generation, also focused on Shankaradeva's 
Shankardeva is the source of strength and unity for the Assamese people. The fountainhead of Assamese culture. Today, these efforts have borne fruit. There have been deep research now in the last, um, about last uh, 100 years almost, into his work and mission by such eminent scholars as Dr. Moheser Neo, Dimbeser Neo, and numerous others. There is today a massive revival of the Satra, Satriya form of dance, uh, which was associated with dance dramas, and uh, which now happened to be pursued as an independent dance form. Borgids have become popular. The only threat uh, to them is that from commercial popular music influenced by the music market and the mass media. Of course, there is the danger of getting stuck in one groove socially and culturally. The various ethnic groups are to some extent untouched by this revival and they are keen to revive their own cultural heritage. Culture thus gets adrift from the vital lessons of unity, brotherhood and tolerance and a liberating vision of life. And I'll stop here today. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I would now open it for discussion. Uh, we initially thought that one of our students here, you know, who is uh, Partho is the main advisor to him, but I'm also in his committee, uh, Shamma Ghosh. We expected that he would be present and he could uh, start off the discussion because he's not here. Uh, I welcome comments and questions. Partho, would you like to start off? Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Gohai. Uh, this was very informative. And my own uh, knowledge of the Shankardev movement is, I remember reading Professor Moheshan Yog's book several years ago. And also some essays by Professor Omalindu Guho. Uh, but I will ask you, uh, there are two questions which are more like social history kind of questions. One is on the question of caste. And you mentioned, of course, that in, in, in Shankardev's own uh, um, preaching and uh, his, his, his influence on the movement, it was clearly aimed against the caste hierarchy and, 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 and caste oppression and so on. But, and I'm asking this uh, in comparison with, with uh, the Vaishnava movement in Bengal, which is roughly from of a similar period, that after the initial uh, preachings of Chaitanya, once the uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava movement becomes institutionalized, the institution itself is very clearly uh, structured according to a caste hierarchy. Uh, you have the Brahmin domination in terms of the intellectual leadership. The organizational leadership is very, very Brahminical. And then you have a, a second rung of essentially trading castes and wealthy, relatively affluent uh, peasant communities. And then, of course, there is a very large congregational following, which is which cuts across many caste uh, divisions, which is largely activated at the times of the great festivals, which of course everybody comes together. But as far as the sort of daily lives of you know, ordinary Vaishnava families are concerned, uh, it, is the, it is my impression that caste hierarchies and caste rules are quite strongly maintained. They were, especially through the institution of the family guru, for instance, it's very common in the Bengal uh, case. Uh, so my question in relation to Assam is that 
when you say that uh, you know in the end the shatras also uh, become uh, structured according to caste uh, is there some explanation of what it is that enables uh, you know the wider uh, <coughs> structures of brahmanical society to actually then recolonize this uh, space which is which begins as an oppositional space and yet it somehow gets uh, incorporated so that was my first question and the second one is about the mohamaria uh, uprising which of course takes place uh, what is it 150 years or even more after shankar dev uh, uh, this as far as i i know uh, was a large scale peasant movement where the shatras actually took the leadership in 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 the rebellion against the ahom uh, regime what is it that enabled uh, these bhushna institutions uh, monasteries to actually lead a what was quite a violent uh, peasant rebellion uh, this is something we don't as far as i know we don't find this in bengal or uh, odisha uh, so um, what is it about the mohamaria uprising Uh, that allowed for this kind of violent peasant resistance. Uh, could I, if I could add, yeah, I will answer the second first question first. Okay. I am afraid Dr. Amolendu Guha was misinformed about the role of the sutras. Most of the sutras took a rather conservative position, and in fact. the main sutras in the majuli river island they came to sort of a conflict with the mohamoriyas mohamoriyas attacked them pillaged their sutras and so put some bhushna about devotees of those sutras to the sword so it is not uh, not a fact that all the sutras took part in the rebellion Uh, i don't know how dr guha had from this opinion but all my information shows that only the mohamoriya sutra remained the the leading light of the movement and uh, though it did not actively take part except the dekha dekhart of the younger uh, younger head of the monastery mohamoriya sutra actually it had been the morans and motoks tribals who were relegated to a lower caste by the brahminic orthodoxy and by the ahom monarchy who took the leading role in the rebellion and remained throughout the main force and also it must be said that they did not find then a wider support base in other communities although most of them all of most of them must have been disaffected disaffected with the increasing feudal burdens imposed by the ahom monarchy so most of us sutras except mohamoriya sutra did not lead the rebellion as dr guha would have it and the first question is of course more difficult it seems that the, from the 18th century onwards there had been a brahminical restoration all over india all over india the liberating bhakti movement seemed to uh, seem to get stuck and the brahminism rolled back and overcame them so that uh, most of the vaishnavas remain separate sects even castes i think some vaishnavas are also castes in bengal yes i mean if i'm yeah. yes not sir. wrong yes and they are, uh, lower, no, lower I mean, they are usually of a lower rank in in bengal no, 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 no. but there there's a caste not a jat bhushna but a separate caste 
but usually lower. No, no, you see, this is this is the way hegemony culture, hegemony works. The, the, the upper caste appropriate Vaishnavism, and they declare themselves a superior authority on it. Whereas the true beneficiaries who remain in the lower ranks of society, they got sort of detest and were forced to become a sect by themselves, a caste by themselves. And um, I don't know, I had done some preliminary research on this. I had found that in the 14th, from, from 13th to 14th century, Muslim rule, whether the Sultanate in Bengal or the uh, Turkish rulers in Delhi, there had been some kind of a, an urban revolution with cottage industries and traders. You know, uh, suddenly being stimulated into some kind of uh, not only industrial, but also cultural activity. So Kabir and Nanak probably had benefited from it. And afterwards, uh, and that had a kind of somewhat loosening effect on feudal, feudal ties and had a sort of the individual soul, individual human being was partly liberated for some time. So you had Mirabai revolting against patriarchy in a way, and the lower caste people becoming saints like Rabbi Das. Now, so it was a bold, humane, and uh, the challenge to Brahminical ideas of fixed dominance of upper castes. So I think that needs in deeper research now. But that period did see a kind of liberating uh, social environment where this found soil. Otherwise, Kabir could not have expressed such content for both Muslim and Hindu Orthodox. So that is my impression, though I am no authority or expert in it. I had an associated question. Uh, it's a kind yeah. of follow-up of Pastor's yeah. first question. Yeah. Now, for anyone who is interested in any kind of, uh, I should, should not say rad radical, but any kind of emancipatory social change, uh, for him, the question of why the Bhakti movement is not able to loosen up you know, the hierarchy of caste, I think it is a central question. I have a I have a hypothesis, which I wanted to uh, ask you to comment on. You know, it seems to me that uh, when I read, let's say, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, or the Are Bengali you? Chaitanya Charitamrita, yeah. uh, or any of the Bengali version of text, to put it very simply, I think. They believe that this that caste can be loosened up by an individual deciding to treat people from lower caste more humanely. Which means that you know I individually treat people who are of lower caste, peasants or servants and others, with greater humanity. But the problem with them is that they simply do not have an idea, a modern idea of caste as a structure. Which basically means that you know my doing whatever I can, I might actually spend my life in being nice to these people, right? It does not actually have any effect on the structural position of those people. So my hypothesis is that until you have the rise of the modern idea of what I would call the plasticity of society, that the social structure itself in which people are embedded, this is something which can be changed by collective action. You know, you cannot, uh, you cannot affect the structure of caste very profoundly. Now, there are two 
factors to be taken into account. First of all, uh, Kabir and Nanak. Initially, before caste hierarchy, caste orthodoxy set in, you know, initially they were quite free about it. Kabir said, I don't care for Brahmins or Sudras. Hmm. Does Sudra have, a, have iron in his blood? And the Brahmin has have gold in his blood? Things like this. Hmm. He says that I don't care for either Mullahs in their mosques or Hindu Brahmins in their temples. Hmm. It's quite a radical challenge. And sometimes, you know, social revolution is preceded by these radical ideas, as you know very well. Oh. And there are some others also speaking on those lines. But Brahmin, uh, Brahminism survives because of its extraordinary resilience and ability to respond to such challenges. So they, they try to water it down to you know, treating Sudras more humanely. Oh. Uh, that had not been the inspiration for Kabir and others. And what actually happened in society? That's a matter I have said, I, I have no little knowledge, but it should be, you know, considered and uh, examined seriously. I don't see researchers doing it. You know. It's oh. a very important question to be settled in Indian history. Why after Kabir, his ideas could not, did not spread and bring about social revolution. After all, revolutions are not brought about words. There must be social forces. And the social forces that had arisen at that time could not mature problem, could not organize could not become a kind of revolutionary social uh, force. So that must be the answer to your question. Though I, I must say, I must admit that uh, I have not dealt into the, uh, dealt, uh, the into, dealt in, uh, you know, I have not gone into the social dynamics at some mm -hmm. length. Vishnu? Vishnu? Uh, I, now. I have much to hold now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have just one, uh, two, uh, one kind of uh, conjecture and another one is a kind of, uh, in, in the context of Orissa, the, the equivalent kind of Namgar and Shankardev is Jagannath Das and, yeah. and Bhagavad Ghar. We call it Bhagavad Kungi. When uh, Bhagavat Puran was transcreated in by Jagannath Das, 15th, 16th century. Sorry? By, by, by 16th century. Yeah. The, the Brahmin's reaction to that, that, you can call it transcreation of Bhagavat Puran by describing it as a Bhagavata of the oil pressure caste. It is called Teli Bhagavata. That is how yeah, yeah. the Brahmins treated the, it's an irony in history that that is the most popular text subtly in coastal Orissa, but also in the other parts of Orissa, the Bhagavat remains still a very popular text, despite the Brahmanical reaction. In fact, there is Bhagavad a- Gita. Bhagavad no, Gita. Bhagavad Puran. Puran. Bhagavad Puran. Puran. Hmm. Bhagavad Puran by Jagannath Das. Jagannath Das Bhagavat is a transcreated text where it, it acts both ways. It is also brings in Bhagavad Puran, a Sanskrit Bhagavad Puran, and turns into and integrates into, into the Jagannath. And sure. everywhere, when I followed the original and, 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 and Jagannath Bhagavat, everywhere there is uh, Krishna has been, Jagannath has been put in there, in, in Odia Bhagavat and stuff like that. It's one. So there is a Sankardev connection with Jagannath Das. In, in, and and I, I, I somebody read a paper once. I I'm trying to look at the connection because there is similar kind of 
uh, structure. So other thing, which is a very methodological question, thinking about these things in connection with the radical or emancipatory change. One is that if I were somebody who belongs to the lower caste groups, and I know that bringing about a social transformation is very difficult, what these things do, Bhakti, Shankar Dev or Jagannath Das or Bhima Bhoi, they do is actually creates a possibility within me of challenging them, but not necessarily socially, but creating an inner source of dignity, which I think we often tend to ignore. We think because one has to really think if one were to place there oneself, that if I'm humiliated every day, how do I cope? How do I create an alternative imagining? How do I create new resources for my living? How do I, and in other words, what I'm saying that bhakti has an ontological dimension. This ontological dimension, the dimension that really impinges on our being. And that's one of the reasons why Kabir, for example, often would say, there's a famous Kabir song which says, uh, to Ram Bhaj Jag Ladhne De. What does it mean? It means that there is, who is saying that to Ram Bhaj Jag Ladhne De? Is it the same Kabir who is trying to say that I, I reject this, I reject that? Are they compatible? According to me, they're compatible. They're compatible precisely because it depends on who is saying and what are the meaning of, of things like that. So one of the reasons why I think sometimes we, we, I mean, I'm saying that we in the kind of broad sense that we, by, by, by plugging bhakti into a very straight jacketed understanding of emancipation and, and social change, we haven't really adequately appreciated. And that's one of the reasons why as Marxists sometimes we fail, we didn't adequately appreciate what it did for the people who could not in the absence of bringing about a social revolution, what it did to them. For example, think of one example of bringing various people together. Kabir in one place says, I think this I read in um, Ramakrishna's Kathamrit, where he says, Kabir once, once says that I treat Sagun Brahma as my, and Nirgun Brahma as my father, but Sagun Brahma as my mother. What is, what is the point of saying this? What is the point of, of bringing this about? What is this, what is this bringing about, you know, whether Jagannath is talking about bringing various kinds of people together. What I'm trying to submit here is that, that reading Sankar Dev, uh, reading uh, Jagannath Das Bhagavat, reading Kabir, I think there is an element of elements which really get overlooked or not adequately understood because we are constantly looking for its possibility in terms of actual social transformation. What it does to people's psyche, okay. what it does to how I live every day, what it does to my self-respect. I think Ambedkar understood it much better. And may I, may I, may I one understand that why- This is, a, this is, a, yeah. this is an so extended question. Yeah. yeah. You we see, should, we I can let you go after this, yeah. Now, the point is that, I have not spoken here as an orthodox Marxist. Communists in Assam have not cared much for Sankar Dev. You see, I had clearly pointed out in my speech that the common man harried and tortured by the burden of feudal prison, compulsory labor and caste oppression was initiated into an enlarging vision of his own place in an exhaustively varied and inexpressibly large universe. He can conceive and articulate a sense of his own destiny against the background and look forward to a life of serenity and ultimate transcendence of fate and face calamities of life in peace and fortitude. Thus endowed with spiritual dignity and nobility, he could face the world with some courage and spunk. However, by some work of history, uh, so on. So I did make that point that the individual was empowered. It is not that, but the fact is that in spite of this empowerment, 
in his personal life, socially he faces, continues to face indignities, oppression, and this reinforces his sense of inferiority in some way. Okay. I think, uh, you know, uh, we should we should allow Professor Gohai to go and have his dinner now. We do. <coughs> Arun, is that, is that all right? Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, you know, for uh, taking part in this and uh, okay. talking about somebody who is a really major figure and uh, initiating us into this. I'm sure in the later discussions that we have, we will yeah. pick it up yeah. and we'll take up these ideas and have discussions about them. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Professor Kabiras. Good night. These are very heartening words. Good night. Good night. So Arun, should I close now? Yes. Uh, yeah, you can you can close it, but you can give a closing remark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no closing. You know, I know very little about this subject. The closing remark just would be that you know it's good that we. I think this is very important. You know, this also partly reflects what I was talking to Partho last night. Uh, you know, Partho's new book on truth and uh, the truths and lies of nationalism. Uh, the chapter where he talks about what can be a kind of alternative idea of federalism. That is, how do we understand the diversity of regions as a strength rather than a weakness? You know, it's linked in, if you do intellectual history, I think it's reflected in intellectual history in this way, that we should not, we should alter our conception of India as uh, you know, a space which is dominated by certain centers, you know, the uh, Central Indian Center and the Bengali Center. And, you know, centers can, uh, might be not geographic, centers can also be historical. In the sense that if you think of Akbar's time, Bengal <laughs> is not dominant in any sense. But after the coming of the British, Bengal gradually becomes dominant and central in that sense. Yeah. And I think both spatially and historically, if you want to do real intellectual history about India, I think it's very important to uh, to use uh, an offensive term, you know, to rescue the idea that places like Assam or Odisha, etc. You know, these are either borderland, which means that, you know, they're peripheral, or they're interstitial. So between, uh, you know, the major focus on Bengal and the major focus on Tamil Nadu, uh, Tamil culture. So Andhra and Odisha is interstitial between them. So the, I, I think it's a very simple idea that people who think they, uh, to use the, uh, you know, Mircea Eliad kind of uh, idea, a simple idea that, you know, everybody thinks that where he is and he himself is actually the center of the, of the world. So that is the axis of the, of the world, right? So this is an absolutely obvious point. And we forget about that when we do intellectual history in this kind of way. So I think it's very important to uh, revive discussions about these things. So I, I personally would uh, be very happy if we have, let's say, follow-up discussion on Odisha, uh, maybe on the Sarala Mahabharata uh, again, or uh, another discussion on Shankar Dev in Assam or some other text or something like that. So that's why, although we got him for a rather short time, uh, I'm very happy that we did. And, uh, you know, I think it actually reflects a kind of conceptualization of Indian intellectual history, uh, which is different from the way in which it's standardly done. Yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, as we're now discussing this Bhakti movement, Western movement spread out from Assam, Bengal, Odisha. Uh, what could be their uh, differential reflection on uh, Bhagavad Purana? Uh, and what could be the original way accounts of caste system which is reflected in their writings or in their storytelling? Uh, because the original variations uh, should be configured. We are, we are simply you know, giving a general account of uh, uh, the anti caste, etc. But it is necessary to decode, deconstruct uh, further and uh, 
argue with regional specificities of uh, their contributions sure. i think we haven't had uh, in our discussions i think we should probably ask mangesh or somebody mangesh uh, is here uh, i'm not necessarily saying that he himself will do it but to find somebody who can make a presentation on let's say bhakti in marathi because it's a very very important uh, scene of bhakti so at the same time you know we should also guard against this uh, temptation of um, some kind of you know general liberal equality of regions that you know <laughs> believe oh. that so we must prove that all regions actually thought equally uh, on mm. certain questions it's a mat- matter of accident you know some region had a great poet another region did not so but to select the regions which were very important and then do discussion on those and then mm-hmm. after that what you suggested i think is a very productive idea which i think now that covid is coming to an end uh, probably you should try to do it a bit more formally between let's say hyderabad university priya uh, i have a student who would start teaching at ashoka i can also ask him or i can ask him sindhani associated with ashoka i'm not saying necessarily in one of those universities but through some kind of collaboration you know take take something like your idea that you know how is the bhagavad taken up in different regions or something like that you know comparing vaishnavism in different regions i think is a very interesting oh. a very interesting project Vishnu, you wanted to say something. Sorry. No, I, I wanted to say that look, often our uh, reflection on history and these kind of processes are divided into national and regional. Regional okay. is a ambiguous term. Sometimes people okay. regional because regional is an overlapping thing. What really happens? I don't really want to see that we should really get trapped in saying Orissa, Bengal, Bihar, okay. Maharashtra, if they are really bounded places. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. In fact, once we 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 don't see it like that, then actually reason has a greater overlapping fluid uh, of kind course. of this thing. So I so of therefore uh, to see uh, because they're all accidents. How the political territorial this thing are all accidents, and often our history writing has oscillated between these two hegemonic modes. Sure. One is the national. One is the I'm writing history about or in Indian or in Orissa or Bengal or Maharashtra. Yeah. Yeah. Why yeah. why should that be? So I think hmm. I think so. This is where we have to break some of these molds, uh, at least in our conversation. Second, uh, is that on the on the question of bhakti and so on, there's not a single region in this country where bhakti hasn't really, to use a metaphor, the the water of bhakti hasn't flowed. So I think it is wonderful to see that how, you know, the the what what it has done, what 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 is the what possibility is created and 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 the, it created suddenly an interiority it has certainly created you know one of the reason it, it hasn't created a revolution it hasn't created a transformation a social transformation it has created some interiority it has created certain way of thinking about the world about our placement in the in the world about ourselves about bigger metaphysical questions that we often tend to ignore in our kind of conversation we think uh, you know um, if you if i read bhagavat purana if i read shankar dev i if i bracket the metaphysical question entirely i'm actually dealing with a very truncated version of these ideas it's just no, like i i entirely agree you know i just wanted to make make one point in response to what you said not in refutation of what you said but in response because i think i suspect that that's also what you were saying Uh, and this is something which underlay even our discussion with professor bohai you know i feel that there is something which is very obvious uh, in our use of of uh, concepts which we use uh, in a taken for granted way we feel that it doesn't do anything to distort our thinking but it does you know the ideas of emancipation revolution revolution would be radical these all have such encrusted modern meanings into them that you know the moment you think of revolutionary in a particular way which you cannot avoid then to go with that into the medieval period and ask the question is this person revolutionary or not right that is a that is a false question that's an inappropriate question to ask of him because if uh, what i'm saying is right that you know the plasticity of the social world this is a modern idea 
And if that idea is not there, then to ask somebody, do you want to change the world that way or not, is not a proper question. Because that is not part of his you know, horizon of expectation. And so therefore the idea that you know, bringing uh, this kind of bhakti makes it possible for somebody to lead a life you know, in which he can minimize from his side you know, the humiliation that is offered from the other. Right? With the expectation, if you actually Gandhianize this argument a little bit more, which I think is proper, uh, I see that sometimes in some of the Vaishnavas texts in a subtle way, that, you know, that argument would be that suppose we are thinking of an interaction, simplified interaction between X and Y. Uh, X is a Brahmin and Y is a Dalit. But it is not an accidental, uh, episodic, contingent interaction. They're not meeting uh, at a shop. They're not meeting on the street. They meet every day. Uh, one is a peasant and the other is a landowner or something. Right. So the argument will be that if the Dalit finds a way of standing up with greater dignity, the government can continue to treat him in the earlier way, sometime. But after some time, the Brahmin would have to modulate his uh, response to the Dalit to the new way in which the Dalit presents himself. So which might have a kind of modificatory influence on the interaction between them as a kind of social structure. Like I think that is probably the expectation behind this. But at the same time, it is not something which is linked to the idea of changing the social structure. So I think there are enormous possibilities of this. And the other thing is that you know, I can send to you, if you want, a very famous uh, Sanskrit uh, composition, just over 10, 15, 9, which is supposed to be Bhakti's biography of Bhakti. You know, Bhakti is speaking about herself. And it says that there was a time when I was young, and then I actually jirnatangata, that is, I became old. And for some reason, it says that I became old in Gujarat. No, Gujarat is jirnatangata. But then now I have come to Vrindavan. And I have become, uh, you know, I've become youth and sundari again. <laughs> and revived. So it's a, it's a very famous uh, this thing. So I can send it to you. If yeah, you yeah, Shita, I'll be happy to. You know what I'm saying, Sutada, because our our own preoccupation with social and political questions. For example, Gandhi often would say in explicitly that my objective in life is actually to see God. My objective, so to to think about human lives in compartmental ways, because our subject matter that we deal with in academic disciplines dictate us to do uh, can do a lot of violence to. To of things of we, so so to say to to acknowledge that to say that how uh, our questions are modulated or sometimes are not throwing light in fact obscuring certain aspects of human lives absolutely. have to absolutely. be absolutely. Absolutely. and that's one of the reasons I can never understand uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda nor Ramakrishna by asking only social questions because I cannot understand. Of course. Of course. And, 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 and they're 19th century thing. I mean, it's not about 16th, 17th century thing. They're equally anachronistic to, to, to people's ideas in 19th century. It can be in 20th century. You know, that is That's also a very interesting question, methodologically. Methodologically in the sense that, you know, either you feel that these fellows are fools, <coughs> in spite of their great stature, they do not see certain things that we do. If you give up that prejudice, you know, which is silly prejudice on our part, there's no reason why we should be more, uh, you know, humanity should become progressively cleverer than, <laughs> than the previous generation. So if you abandon that prejudice, I think the most interesting thing is to see that people like Ramakrishna, I think in, it's more pronounced in his case, but also Vivekananda, but more in Ramakrishna. You know, he's very shrewd, very, very shrewd. If you look at the Kathamrita, and his conversations, particularly with people who are highly educated, very sophisticated in their thinking, uh, they're well-trained. So he picks on those people as his adversary, you know, and then engages in a conversation where he has the extraordinary ability of asking two or three questions to those people. And because they themselves are very intelligent, you know, this modernist, 
they become completely deflated. You know, it's like pricking a balloon. The man who uh, who wrote down Kothamrita, he said something, he recorded something which is like that, you know, which I found extraordinary. Uh, he said that uh, when I got to know him, the second day when I went to him, Ramakrishna said, uh, ask questions about me. So are you married? So he said, yes, I'm married. Yes, and yes. he asked a question about his wife. And this man, Sri Ma, who writes Kathamrita, he says, I also said apologetically that she's a very good woman, but organ. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she is not very educated or whatever. But the term he used, you know, fatally in conversation with Krishna was, uh, I don't, I forget what the first characterization was. That she's a very yes, ethically yes. good woman, yeah, but yeah. again, right? And Ramakrishna simply asked him a question after that. He did, doesn't even give a proper propositional answer. He says, Oh, to me, would you be shown Gandhi? Mm -hmm. Just that question, you know, yeah, to me, would you be shown Gandhi? And he didn't pursue that at all. And Srimad says that, you know, he left it at that. I got into my coat. And it took me some time to drive back to Kolkata. And that question began to ring in my mind. That, you know, and I started thinking, what have I done? You know, I've been in front of this man, who is a big man, great or not, he doesn't know yet. So he said that I'll give him the benefit of doubt. So he's a big man. And I said something which is really stupid. I shouldn't have done that. How could I say that, you know, she's a man? And yeah, yeah, it right, implies... Right. It implies that I'm a big man, and so I must get out of it. And then, so he recounts his own process of this deflation. Yes, yes. And the interest, but I'll come back to Vishnu's point. I think it's a very important point. You know, Ramakrishna could not have not known that he's using a form of thinking, you know, religious wisdom, whatever you want to call it a form of thinking which is not the form of thinking of that time. You know, historically, it comes from elsewhere from an earlier time. It's not given much prestige. So he is actually deliberately taking that up. And he is querulously, you know, combatively, uh, telling these people that you come with a certain apparatus of knowledge. I come with a different apparatus of knowledge, right? But I'll take you on. And let us come into some kind of a conversation because that is the conversation of history that is going on. So he doesn't put it in our historical kind of language. But I think in Ramakrishna particularly, what is historical sense? Historical sense is that you're living at a time where deep transformations are going on. And if there's a deep transformation going on, there would be two sides. You know, the older side and the newer side. And historical sense is an acute sense of the difference between these two sides. You know, doing something with it. You might, you might side with the new, you might side with the old or whatever, but the acute sense of their difference and that in your own personal life, you can do something with this to make your own life meaningful. You know, that is historical sense to me. And so to say that these people have no sense of history is a totally stupid way of you know, getting into it. So I think it's a big question, a very, very important question. But the bhakti thing also, I think, is very interesting. You know, we can do it in two ways. We can do it as bhakti, as the variations of bhakti. Remember that, you know, there's something which I find fascinating because over the last couple of years, I've been reading the uh, Sanskrit texts, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and Pujkala Nilamani, etc. Because I wanted to balance to some extent, you know, my knowledge of the literature of Vaishnavism, which I have for a very long time, with the philosophical text, because I never had any interest in them. So that is also quite interesting. That you know, the, the philosophical articulation of bhakti and the literary articulation of bhakti. I've said in my Bengali book that you know there's a contest between them. That what is Radha? Is Radha the Ladini Shakti of Krishna, etc.? So Krishna, like uh, you know, Dahika Shakti is the, is the Shakti of fire. So that is the version of philosophical interpretation. And the Vidyapati uh, Jayadev interpretation is that she is simply just a metaphor of humanity. And so there's a big tussle between these two, and I think, you know, the poets win. So I think the 
uh, there can be, uh, I, I shouldn't say can be, I think there must be, if we can want to get into <laughs> Indian, pre-modern Indian intellectual history. I think, I think bhakti, we, you know, Sweetada, the bhakti thing would be quite an interesting thing, provided we read, uh, uh, I mean, we, we may not uh, go through Narada's Bhakti Sutra, but at least the the way some of these texts have really appears, for example, uh, the often the Odia Vaishnavas distinguish themselves from the Gaudiyas, saying that they are bhakti is jnana mistra bhakti. Hmm. Now, now there is what is the jnana mistra bhakti? Because there is a old tradition where the bhakti and jnanas are seen as two distinct. Of course, authors. of course. Of course, if you, we know that in, in, in uh, we know that in, in the writings of Sri Ramakrishna, whether it is Bhagavan Ramana, Maharshi, you will find that the jnana and bhakti are really people are trying to put them together. You know, sometimes the people say uh, uh, bhakti is jnana mata. You know, the very various ways in which you will find sure. so various kinds of ways in which you would be able to talk about these things. Oh. <clears throat> and, I'll show you. And, I'll, I'll I'll show you a new face. Yes. Ah, Rajiv. How Hi. Are you? Ah, hey, how are you? Hi, Arun. Hey, Wait, were you sleeping or what? Sorry, I couldn't take part in this because I had some other things. Ah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it is quite good. It is quite good. Yes. So you are also in Colombia. <laughs> so that the uh, it seems that the COVID is gone. <laughs> you guys are all traveling, eh? Everybody's silent. You can't. You can't. No, no Rajiv, no, I, I think you can. Uh, you can hear I, can, I can hear you, Rajiv. We couldn't hear for for for, for a sec, few seconds. Oh, I see. I see. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Say that again. No, I'm saying that the, see. it seems the COVID is over, and you guys started traveling. That's what I'm telling to Rajiv. Oh. <laughs> yes, we we started that. And I couldn't. I, I don't think Rajiv could hear. I said that the it seems that the COVID is over, and you guys have started traveling the world now. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it, it's a, it's a, it's a great sign of optimism. I hope. They cool. They cool. <laughs> But what I, I'm told fourth phase is coming. <laughs> the fourth wave is coming. Fourth wave? Well, I think now we are in the endemic stage, not the pandemic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so endemic, we all get something endemic, like that. Yeah. You are in the oh. endemic phase. Yes, true. That we cannot. That's going to live with us forever now. <laughs> yeah, looks like. Yeah. There is a, uh, Sutada, there is a student, uh, former student of yours who has joined us as a postdoctoral fellow, Sayuri. 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 Yeah, she was my student, but she finished her <coughs> PhD mainly with Patso. And what is Sayuri means in Bengali? Sayuri, Sayuri is, a, is a lake. Oh. Shire, Shire is a lake. Oh, really? Shire must be in Odia as well. No. Don't you have things like Vishnu Shire? No, no, no. Shire is a lake. Uh, lake, uh, oh. this thing is uh, rather in, in, in Odia. Oh. Shire is a lake. So Shire, Shire is a lake. Lake. Is, uh, feminine from lake. Yeah, lake, okay. No, okay. No, I, I don't think I, maybe, uh, I don't really think uh, we have that. Oh. So think about that. You know, think about, uh, you know, some discussion about bhakti and oh. if you make it more specific. Rent in different uh, yeah, different regional regional traditions. I think that. Mangalas Kulkarni has suggested Jantha Lilis. has done what? Also, there is a Sutada. There is a information about uh, there is a, a Hindi volume of my translation of poetry. Fifty of my their old poems. They came out last month. Oh, good. And it looks like this. It's oh, called Buddha good. or Arm. Very good. I'll also show you something. Buddha and Mango. Uh. You, uh, you must have seen Partho's book. 
No, no, I haven't okay. seen. So, would you show that uh, this thing, the truth and lies of nationalism? I'll show you. When, when, I'll when did it come out? He gave the copy to Rajiv last night. When, I'll when did it come out? It came out, I think, about two months back, two, three months. Yeah, but back. somehow I haven't seen it. No. I'll show uh, it to you. Arun, have you seen it? No, no, no. No, I haven't seen. It. It must be, uh, I think the, at least I haven't seen any notice of that at all. So Arun, okay. everything is okay? Uh, yeah, yeah. And Andy Lanjan? Lanjan. Yes, sir. How are you? All right. How are you? Uh, I remember you. How are you doing? Yes, sir. I too remember you. Or something. Yeah, yeah. Good. I'm very happy to see you. Yes, sir. So actually, I had went to Guwahati to attend the IPSA seminar. Uh -huh. So I'm back back from there now in Silivuri. Oh, really? Oh, very good. Excellent. So Arun, you're doing all right? Yeah, fine. It is OUP and Orient Black Swan. OUP and Orient Black Swan. And this is my book. Oh, good. Um. Oh, fantastic. Mark so. Oh, Shakti Sandhan. Okay. 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 Um, right. I've got several books in my head. Huh. Right. <laughs> they, are not, they are not coming out. Abhi <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Rajiv, so, you know, very greedy. You are 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 greedy. You it's another point. <laughs> 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 so, Saktiar Sandhan is that what is it's about truth, uh, Sritada? What is that? No, it is Shorgir Sandhan. Shorgir, Shorgir Sandhan. Oh, Shorgir Sandhan, okay. okay. Uh, one more here, we discussed earlier, no? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, the title of the article was Marxism and the Search for Paradise. Uh, I think we read, we read a part of it, I think Nilanjan. Uh, read it out to us, Arun and me. Uh, Ilanjan, is it true? The book is slightly yes, different. The yeah. title of the book is Marx and the Search for Paradise. Uh, and who has published this in Bengal? This is published by Onushtu. Onushtu, Onushtu. Published yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Paper. Sir, when yeah. we read uh, when uh, we we read uh, this uh, the last this the last article, Shorgesh Sondhan, uh, uh, sir, uh, you were not there. Me and Pro Professor Patnaik sir were there. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I missed. I missed that article. Uh, Jitada, I read. I met actually the editor of Anushtup once many years ago. Uh, I don't know uh, in in Calcutta, of course. I forget the name that. now. Uh, Oni Lachacho. Uh, yes, I, yes. Oh, I, think, yeah. I, I met with uh, uh, then Swapan and me. I think we Swapan took me. We met uh, Swapan Chakravarti. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, 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 my honest is anyway very uh, highbrow journal. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, I also published in English. I sent you a copy of the uh, English version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You must have got a copy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I only think, uh, Shwetadai, while listening to Bengali, I, I uh, sometimes it felt it's not a it's not a criticism of your uh, Bengali writing because I, I'm not really. Uh, don't read it in original as well as uh, Nilanjan or anybody would read. But sometimes it appear, appeared to me as a kind of translation, as if you are thinking in English and writing it in Bengali. Uh, no, that's not that's not right. That's not true. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. Because uh, because I don't think are, any Bengali will say that. No, because no, no. Because what I would say, what what I why I thought that because if you are describing in, uh, in Bengali. Uh, you, we don't have, for example, if I write in Oriya, I don't really thinking the same uh, way. Uh, the thinking changes. Of course. The thinking no, changes, and therefore uh, the structure changes. 
the criticism that I get, which I think is uh, is an appropriate criticism, Rithik is here. So Rithik reads Bengali. Uh, he would be able to give a different response because he comes from a different uh, generation as well. Uh, the criticism that I get, which I accept, is that I sometimes use uh, unconventional Sanskrit words, not always difficult Sanskrit words, but unconventional. I have a very close friend in London who is a poet and uh, very, very thoughtful. So he read my book and he sent me a very long response, which was generally, generally a very positive response. But he said, he gave me an example. He says that um, there are six or seven words which I came across in your book, which I could not find in a Bengali dictionary. And I also could not find in a common Sanskrit dictionary. I told him that if you gone, if you had gone into Monier Williams, you would have got it. But Monier Williams is a highly technical Sanskrit dictionary. I'll give you an example. You know, part of my argument in favor of Vaishnavism is the strength of Vaishnavism, what the Vaishnavas are saying to the philosophers is that don't waste your time thinking about perfection for two reasons. One is you can never describe perfection. Human words are inadequate for describing perfection. And the other thing is that, you know, perfection doesn't need your help to be attractive to people. You know, it is perfect. So that itself, that itself is adequate. But you are mistaking the task of the philosopher. You've been endowed with high intelligence. So use your intelligence. God has given you that intelligence with a purpose. The purpose is to defend the imperfect. Defend the imperfect. You know, you must have the philosophical courage to come out and, def and say about something it is imperfect, I know that. But that is why it needs defense. And I'm defending it. You know, this is what the Vaishnavas are saying. So this is partly my argument in that but, sense. Is there any, can you suggest some reference for what you're suggesting just now? You know, the any place that I can read a word if, where where the task of the philosopher is described like this. They don't, they don't say or a writer explicitly like that. You know, if you read the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, hmm. uh, the first opening move is that you know um, Bhakti is moksha laghuta karini. You know, moksha, which was the uh, liberation which was the of the of the. Uh, even the Vaishnavas before, hmm. you know, they wanted moksha. They yes. wanted to go to Vaikuntha. Yes, of course. These fellows are saying we have no truck with Vaikuntha. We don't want to go to Vaikuntha. We want to go to Vrindavan. Hmm. Vrindavan is not Vaikuntha. It's a Nitya Rasa. So Vrindavan is not perfection. Vaikuntha perfection. Yes. Right? yes. And uh, by through philosophical thinking, those people actually give you six features of uh, being with Vishnu. What does being in Vaikuntha mean? You know, Sarshki, Sadukya, Samitya, etc. So they are saying in the in the first few sentences that bhakti is moksha laguta karine. That is, if you understand bhakti, moksha would lose its charm for you. Right? Yes. So in, you know, they are high. Sanskrit reflection is about this, but not in my language. But I'll give you an example of the language thing. So I used the term Aradha. You know, Aradha. Dadha. A. A is non. Yes. Right? Radha is perfect. Yes. That is, it comes from the verb, which you also use for ra Radha, you know, Aradhana, etc. That, uh, you know, that which is, uh, which is deserving of, you know, complete admiration. Aradhya. Rabdha. Aradhya. Rabdha. Yes. Yes. Rabdha is perfect. And I use the term Aradha. Yeah, Aradhya is a term that we use perfect. as well. Imperfect. Uh -huh. Right. Now, he said that I do not want you to change that sentence. He says that I've never come across this word, Aradha. But he says that the way you 
develop your argument is completely clear to me that what you mean by that is imperfect. Although I think in brackets, I have put in the English word imperfect. So this is a criticism that I face quite often. A lot of people say that, you know, you use too much of Sanskrit. I'm not criticizing, uh, Suitada, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just trying to understand. Uh, no, 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 even the, the, at all. Because, I, I, because this is a challenge. This is a challenge for bilingual um, yeah. intelligentsia. A particularly without, bilingual intelligentsia. That without this, how can you how can you improve? Yeah, yeah. The other thing is that the in Odia the Aradhya has the opposite meaning. In Odia, this is called Aradhya, which means that something is worth worshipping. Worth worshipping, yeah, that, that, yeah. That is a different. That's a different spelling. Yeah, that's a different spelling. It must be R R double dha. We call it double dha. R R dha. So that means the same thing in Bengali also. Bengali as well. Okay. Yeah. Means exactly the same thing in, in Bengali. Yeah, yeah. So, so because I, I was trying to figure it out because the argument Sitada was that I once was talking to Parthada as well that when we write as bilingual because when I write poetry and my do my English. Um, uh, as in social science, the division of labor is very, uh, uh, very clear. That, yeah. that when I do my poetry in Odia and do my social science in English, the division is very clear. The, the, the expressions are very clear, the different uh, tasks and different labor. But when I do social science in, in Odia, the, the, the question comes very differently uh, to me. And sometimes uh, my, my uh, hunch is that uh, writing in social science in Odia would not be same as writing social science in English. Not because I write in Odia. The writing oh. mode, the mode of writing, oh. mode of expression will oh. definitely oh. change. And therefore it will have conceptual underpinnings may also change. Absolutely. If the language is constitutive of what, what we are doing, oh. then it, it must change. Absolutely. And that's, that's the point, uh, this thing. But we enjoyed, I, I must say that we enjoyed, in fact, there are quite a few terms that Nilanjan would remember that we noted down and we thought that is a beautiful way, way. Nilanjan, if you remember when we read, because he read out the essay, there are quite a few places, the terms we underline. I say, I must tell Sujita, this is the term I like. This is the, this is an unconventional way of translating it from this to this, but this is I like, this is far better than- I have to, I have to leave now. No, no, please, yes. <laughs> I'm also hungry at dinner time. We can have another session. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No problem. If you, if you have the time, I would like to talk to you sometime on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. I leave now. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Nilanjan, bye bye. Arun, bye. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Bye, sir. Bye, Ritik. If you get something to say, but uh, we... I think we are saying... We are trying to your, <laughs> your thing came up. You you want to say something? He said something about uh, Aradhya. Yeah, you are mute. Aradhya, he, he quoted uh, Monia Williams. I don't uh, know if it is there. I don't it's know. in the chat, in chat box, he has posted. Uh, he has posted. Okay, let me see. Uh, Aradhya. Uh, Radhya printed uh, Radhya. to be accomplished or performed. Perform. To be obtained or won. Obtained or won. Uh, to be appeased or propitiated. To, appeased or propitiated. Uh, to be worshipped. But this Aradhya that uh, Suitada is saying that I is not the opposite in case of Aradhya. Uh, true, true, true. It is, it is the same. I is actually I is enhancing this. Uh, exactly. What the, what the yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is not, uh, it is not opposite. But I don't know what, uh, how, uh, what exactly alphabet C you have to see. Double yeah, bar, single bar. I, I really don't, I don't really know. But, but Nilanjan, if you remember, yes, sir. we discussed some of the terms that Suitada uses. Yes, some of them mm -hmm. we liked, but some of them we thought that is a kind of pretty, uh, you know, almost writing in English. Oh. Yes, sir. Although he 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 doesn't think that, but uh, right. I mean, no. To be worshipped is the same. You see, is the same uh, as the uh, radhya meaning is the same as the aradhya. No, aradhya means worthy of worshiping. Yeah. Yeah, the same here. Yeah, yeah, same here. Yeah. To be worshipped. So, so one of Williams uh, using a different kind of. Uh, 
ஜிம் பார்த்து So how about you you are fine uh, i'm fine i have a new responsibility in the university we have yeah. there is a endowed um, moturi satyanarayan center for advanced study in humanities and social science in kriya uh. which has been created out of the endowment of moturi satyanarayan family uh-huh. moturi satyanarayan was a telugu man who uh. fought uh, against british Uh, 1942 then became the member of the constituent assembly uh, is one of the few uh, people in the south who also championed the cause of hindi and hindustani okay along with telugu uh, so moturi satyanarayan family his daughter and son in law uh, has en- endowed an institute at kriya uh, and the university has installed me as its first director So congratulations uh, so thank you so that's uh, oh, where uh, uh-huh. we have two post doctoral fellows uh, one is saveri the student uh-huh. partho and uh, sudito uh-huh. and another linguist from jnu a phd from center for languages in in in, in jnu who uh-huh. done a phd on the decaying the the languages and uh, so it's uh-huh. like that So how are you? Uh, otherwise, so that's a new responsibility for the first of April. Uh, okay. okay. So I have just reached the campus. I uh, we will have three more postdoctoral fellows this year. Uh, uh, and I want to see, uh, you know, Velchiri and Aran Rao, uh, one of the great bilingual intellectual of our country, who wrote in Telugu as well as in English. Oh. He has returned from America and now living in near Bijawada. Oh. I met him in Bangalore oh. years ago before COVID. Oh. Uh, he's he's eighty eight, eighty nine, must be ninety, oh. but he's oh. mentally very agile. Oh. I really wanted to meet him personally. I met him in oh. Bangalore personally, oh. and I want to really meet him. I want you to invite him to possible to give our inaugural lecture. Yeah, he's a right person actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a fantastic person. Very good. You know, yeah, I really want we want to see Belchir Narayan. I can talk about Telugu. Both are all. He's also a scientist. Both are the bhakti. You know, there are a lot of stuff happening in in. in I'm told he's also a Sanskritist. Yeah, he's a Sanskritist, but he's a Telugu. Mm. Uh, Telugu is you no know, Tamil. He has translated profusely from Telugu yeah. to true, English. True. Very good with David Sulman, Belchir mm. Narayan Rao, and and Sanjay Subramanian. Yeah, true, true. They have done work together. He is a fantastic uh, this thing. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Come back to India. Oh, so our question, Arun, that you know, I therefore no, no, I was not uh, Gohen, Professor Gohen. I was not critiquing. I was actually critiquing our own limitation of asking only certain kinds of questions. Oh, uh, that's why Swito said he agreed. But I think you know, you we are only asking one kind of questions. Oh, uh, and we are our caste locations are determining those questions. Uh, we have never uh, lived the life of a dalit or a lower caste person uh, in a oppressive situation we don't know what it means to acquire uh, only sources of dignity uh, uh, so don't talk about transformation and emancipation and without uh, knowing why so many raidasis uh, dalits have become raidasi supporters why in punjab there so many dalits have their own gurudwaras 
Oh, why they love Guru Nanak? Why they love their deras? But yet they are uh, their own gurudwaras. <laughs> the gurudwaras, and mm. and don't think that they are don't reduce to them purely psychological, say, social social system. Think of their what it does to their being. The imagination, their aspirations are. So even the even the Ravidasis have now detached from the main body of Sikhism, and they have their yes. own own yeah, sacred the, sacred book now. Yeah, because because they have their gurus. You know, in Guru Nanak, this thing after the guru, they are not supposed to have gurus. Like the Shias in Islam, oh. you know, Shias accept. What is the difference between Shias and Sunnis? For oh. Shias, the prophets are there. Prophets are coming. Oh. Oh. So when, uh, said, no, no prophet, no prophet after this. So when I was in uh, <laughs> when I was in BHU, I had because just at the backside of BHU is yes, Sir yes, Go yes. Sir Govardhanpur, the birthplace yes. of Ravidas. Yes, the big best big festival happened there every year. So I had the opportunity to uh, go there, not on the yes. because it was very problematic to go on the birth day itself because yes, yes, yes of, a lot of people, a lot of. Uh, and I went. Uh, we, uh, me and my friends went uh, three four days back of that uh, festival, and uh, uh, there were and what I saw. I understood the power of the Ravidasya community there because I saw there there there, there are camps set up. Yes. Of almost every state of India. Yes, every state from of India, Asa. even abroad, even for abroad. So from so abroad, they were from America, in. England, you know, Ravidasis. And in, interestingly, in the Assam, uh, in the Assam camp, hmm. what I saw was a picture of Shankar Dev. So yes, hmm. yes, yes. So yes. there is a common connect. Yeah, there's a common hmm. connect. Hmm. And the way they serve the food and. Uh, it's called the like the the roti they serve hmm. Uh, hmm. because it, now there are free langars uh, held at that time and uh, they, it's and every food is referred to as g hmm. like roti is referred to as pasadda pasaddar g hmm. sabzi is called hmm. a sabzi g hmm. so really? that's the respect that yes sir to the, hmm. they gave to their food and all eat whether nri whether indian rich or poor all we have to eat on the grass we have to sit yes. on the grass eat uh, take the food and yes. take the food uh, in this manner Take the food with two hands, for, like uh, yes. here, and they would take, they would take, take, take the food. So it was a very uh, nice experience going and, there. And, and mm. I must tell you my experience of going to Golden Temple in Amritsar. Okay, mm. so in our Odia Temple, we extend our right hand and put our left hand sometimes like that. Symbolically, mm. at two hands, but mm. one hand because we don't use the left hand for uh, taking things. And mm. so in Guru in Golden Temple. After this thing, I was going to get prasad. The guy was aghast that I'm showing <laughs> hand like this. He said, "Not like this. Show it like this." Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. So, so he just uh, yeah. made sure that I had the correct uh, this thing, and he was not going to give mm. me halwa. <laughs> and I got my halwa, but just by showing like this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I really, what I want to say is that some of our intellectual concerns. I'm mean, you know critique. It happens in India, happens in America, happens in England, everywhere. Our intellectual concerns are very narrow. Oh. Despite all our methodological innovation, our intellectual concerns are narrow. Oh. That's one of the reasons why ordinary people don't bother about what we write because it doesn't reflect what they're thinking. And so one thing which I realized this time because uh, after from Guwahati, we, me, and some of my friends, we went to uh, Meghalaya, Cherapunji, yeah. and Shillong. Yes. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of binaries uh, when we stay in Bengal or in some other parts of India. Yeah. Violence, peace. Yes. Tribal, civilized. Yes. The Khasi people, they're wonderful. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, the, the way they and I myself felt ashamed. I thought that I actually don't have the appropriate behavior which they are showing to me. Mm -hmm. Tell me, give me an example. Sir, so the way like I, I can't say about the, the, the body language, the grace which they presented to us. Mm. Like you need food. And one thing that they don't, don't many of us, they, they don't understand our language. Mm -hmm. They only know the Khasi language. But uh, yes. the driver who was taking us, he told us that uh, even if they don't understand the language through their through various signs and symbols, through mm. the body language, they will, like if I want a direction, they will show you the way. Yes, yes. So the binaries at times that these are hostile people, they will not cooperate, uh, savage, civilized, violent. No, that's one of the that's one of the reason why, you know, our, uh, uh, that's one of the reason why in Bengal, the, the, the like all politicians, leftists also fail despite their genuine honesty of understanding society. 
because there are certain part of society we didn't understand. Our categories are quite deeply flawed. And sir, I think for that, like I realized this time because I haven't traveled much, that we need to travel a lot. Yes. Uh, we need to go to places. We need to understand yes. people. You should. You should. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, you should travel. You know, so long you go, you'll find very different, different uh, flavor. Yes, sir. Oh, true. Absolutely. And so on. And then. Okay, Mr. Let us go for dinner. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. I'm also hungry. Good night. So thank yeah. you very much. It is okay. an old time. Felt like old time that you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Reading <laughs> something or you're reading out yeah, a text yeah. or something like that. And okay. sir, uh, just before you leave, uh, just I want to say two, two, three things. Yeah. Uh, that as you said, no, sir, that there are not watertight compartments are really true because uh, where Shankar Dev was patronized by the king of Kujbihar. Yes. Kujbihar is presently in Bengal. Yes. So, and there are some such satras in Kujbihar as well. Yes, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And after many years, someone like uh, there will someone like Ponchanan Burma will come who will try to emancipate the Rajbongshis from the uh, the hierarchical structures. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now he will claim that the Rajvangshis are Kshatriyas. Mm -hmm. What will happen is that when he will say that Rajvangshis are Kshatriyas and there will be a Sanskritization process, mm -hmm. upper caste will say, they, they, they told him that, okay, if they are Kshatriyas, then why are you claiming a special place for them? Because they're already in that hierarchy. Yeah, this yeah. is how I feel that things are appropriated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there is Sankar Dev, there's a Sankar Dev Mat in Puri. They have a they have a particular place in Puri where they do actually Namgar. There's one in Puri. Uh -huh. And sir, I just remember you told uh, asked me an example. I actually lost my mobile phone in Guwahati. Huh. It somehow slipped. I was on the e-rickshaw. It somehow slipped from my pocket. And when I was, I, I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> my yes. mobile phone is gone. Uh -huh. Me and my friend Rakshit, we went back. Uh, it was again in some place called Chandonagar in Guwahati. Some huh. Satra was also there. Huh. And uh, the phone was picked up. Uh, it was some shop, local shopkeeper or something. Something he told uh, me. Uh, he told uh, my friend Rakshit because uh, I didn't have the phone, so Rakshit called him uh, that uh, I am here and here. So uh, yes, the phone is with me. It has uh, it has bumped on the road. And uh, okay, you please come back. So I will stay at this place. And then uh, the the one who was on the, the riding, riding the e rickshaw, he he told contacted keep contacted with him in Assamese. And we reached the spot. I got back my mobile phone. I can't imagine this happening in uh, Bengal or in Delhi, even in Hyderabad. No, nothing, nothing will not happen. I'll tell you, my uh, wife uh, lost her phone. It was picked up in the pit of society. It fell off from her, this thing. When I call this guy, the guy picks up the phone. Okay. I tell him that, look, you can keep the phone. Just keep the SIM. Give the SIM. Give the SIM somewhere where I can go and pick it up. You can keep the phone. And the guy on the other end tells me, Kya tum humko ho? <laughs> And then you should stop the phone. <laughs> Last conversation I had. Uh, he become, so he, he could have given the SIM, but he, no, he was not interested in, you know, because he was thinking that I'm going to catch him and take to police and things like that. Uh, Delhi, so, it, it happened Delhi. Delhi. so Delhi is basically why he, he just wanted uh, the phone. He don't uh, so this is how what the situation. Yeah, yeah. Hyderabad, same thing I had experienced. Yeah. The first yeah. mobile actually fell through. Yeah. First, first, first purchase. Next day it fell through. <laughs> Slipped yeah. from my pocket. And you got it? Uh, no, no. The guy I called, uh, he also didn't know how to switch it off. So it yeah. was still on. Yeah. Then after some time he switched off. Uh -huh. Switched off and uh, he but said. I tell you another interesting story that happened to my son in Bombay. Uh -huh. Uh, he was first day or two days in Bombay. He, while coming out of the local train, he finds that his purse is gone. Oh. Credit card, money and everything is gone. Oh. And he was in St. Javier's College then. Oh. So he went to the college and, and then he called me. I said, look, you cancel your cards and things like that and so on. So he was thinking he got a, a the, there's, there's a guy who came to uh, uh, the guy called in his phone? Mm. The phone came. He said, "Who who are you?" He said, "I'm so and so. Have you lost your purse?" Mm. He said, "Yes, I have." He said, "Where are you?" He said, "I'm in Saint Javier's College. This thing. Okay, I will come to your gate. You come." Mm. So he came, mm. he gave his purse, not his purse. He said, "Count your money. This is the money you had in your purse." Mm. He counted the money, his card, everything. So he said, what happened? 
he said when you are getting off the train there is a pickpocket who picked your pocket acha ha and oh. and there are few guys watching the pickpocket picking his pocket so oh. once he picked the pocket they caught hold of the pickpocket and thrust him oh. got the wallet and oh. from the wallet they found the address of his phone number and they called oh. him Oh. It is a miracle. I mean, it does. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. It, can, it can happen in Bombay. It cannot happen in Delhi. Let me tell you. Uh, it's a miracle. Even I, 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 and when I went there, uh, the person called on the phone number again to check, because I had to tell him the phone number to just to check. He told me that no, the right person should get the phone, so we will check it again. Yes. <laughs> so I was completely amazed. I I don't expect this thing happening in Bengal. Maybe in Siliguri it can happen, not in Kolkata. Yeah, yeah. And I can't I expect this thing happen in uh, any in Delhi or in no, Hyderabad. This will no, not, no, not happen. Not this will not happen. This will yeah, yeah. never happen, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Take care. Uh, uh, Arnaka, will Arnaka get in touch with you? Uh, Arnaka called me. Uh, uh, yeah, he called me yesterday. Uh, yeah, he wanted to speak to somebody who is an expert in Telangana politics. I said, look, talk to Arun Uncle and then find out if uh, he will suggest uh, somebody, maybe Srinivasulu or I don't know who. I said, look. Uh, he wanted to speak somebody about telangana politics yeah sinivas will be right person so did he did you give him his number no he didn't uh, tell me anything ha uh, so what did he say he just chatted and stopped then i said we'll discuss later ha 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 actually today i'm thinking of calling him ha uh, you call him After because he is supposed to his objective was to find somebody an expert in telangana politics oh okay i said he that, first talk he should have told me that uh, Ah, I said first to talk to Arun Uncle. Ah, he should have told me. Yeah, but I mean, then call. find out this thing. I said that our common friend Professor Sinibaslu is retired. Ah, I think, but Arun Uncle be... may also help you to understand the basics of Telangana politics. Just find out first. Yeah, he will be. Uh, Sinibaslu, right person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then you talk to him. He may. I will. I will talk to call him. Yeah. Yeah. So all right then. Arun okay. Uncle, okay. Nilanjan. Okay. Okay. okay ah, sir. Ah, good night. Good night. Good night. Ah, bye. Bye. Good night.